Good evening. I'm Sheila Toll with League of Women Voters San Diego. Um, thank you for joining us. Tonight, tonight's event is available in Spanish, and I'd like to introduce Andrea Roca and Ladna Miller, who are experienced interpreters. Andrea will explain how to access the Spanish interpretation. Um, we are grateful for their presence and assistance. Muy buenas tardes. Este, para accesar esta presentación en español, ustedes pueden hacerle clic a un icono del globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla y ahí puede escoger el, el canal de español. Si usted se encuentra también en el teléfono celular, eh, presione por favor los tres puntos encima de la palabra more o más en la parte derecha de su pantalla, escoge interpretación y también escoja el canal de interpretación. Muchas gracias. Back to you. Thank you. Um, if there are any candidates in attendance today, we'd like to acknowledge you. So please send us a chat with your title or office. Um, we are using Zoom webinar for this event, so attendees will not appear on audio or video. Closed caption and live transcript are available. Click the button in Zoom that says CC hyphen show captions. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A button to submit your question. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website tomorrow. Now, I'd like to introduce Kim Knox. Thank you. Good evening and thank you all for joining us. I'm Kim Knox, president of the League of Women Voters of San Diego. Along with my colleague, Rosette Garcia, president of the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, I would like to welcome you to this event presented by the two leagues in our county. The San Diego League is generally south of Highway 56 and also includes Poway and Rancho Bernardo. The North County League is north of Highway 56, including the eight cities in that area. We work jointly on county and regional issues. The video recording of this event will be available tomorrow on both of our league websites, and those will be in the chat for you. The primary election is scheduled for March 5, and both leagues have planned events in January to prepare. On January 11, the North County League will be offering an election season kickoff event and volunteer orientation. Cynthia Pace, the San Diego County Registrar of Voters, will speak on election integrity and why the county's ballot processing system can be trusted. Register for the event at the North County League website. The San Diego League will hold the volunteer fair at the Sara Mesa Library on Saturday, January 13 at 10 a.m. We're also planning meet and greets for San Diego League members on a couple of Sunday afternoons in January and February. Mark your calendar for Wednesday, January 24 at 1 p.m for a panel discussion on child care access, quality, and affordability at the Nobel Recreation Center. You can register for those events on the San Diego League website. Okay, um, we do have um, one elected official in, in attendance tonight. That is Leticia Mungia, a candidate for, sorry, I should say a candidate, not elected official, for the city of Chula Vista, City Council District 3. Um, so we always appreciate, like to give a little appreciation to people who are running for office because we know it's a lot of work and we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, also want to say that the League is an all volunteer organization and we greatly appreciate the donations that were made during registration for tonight's event. For anyone else who would like to donate, we'll have links in the chat to both the San Diego and North County San Diego League's websites. And now I would like to introduce the uh, chair or the co-chair of our Sustainability and Environmental Action Committee, uh, Ruth Sampen. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. The format for tonight's event is divided into three segments. First, each speaker will discuss the problem and its history. Then all three will discuss the current politics and funding. Starting about 7.30, we will have attendee questions for the speakers. 
please put your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. The moderators for the Q&A will be League of Women Voters North County San Diego President Rosette Garcia and me. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our three speakers. In August 2021, President Joe Biden appointed Maria Elena Henner to serve as the United States Commissioner of the International Boundary and Water Commission, United States and Mexico. Dr. Henner is the second woman and first Latina to hold the post. The International Boundary and Water Commission is responsible for, for applying um, the boundary and water treaties between the two countries and settling differences that arise in their application. The commission operates and maintains flood control levies, international storage reservoirs, diversion dams, wastewater treatment plants, and boundary monuments at locations along the U.S.-Mexico border. Dr. Hener has published extensively on water policy and transboundary bilateral cooperation. Her education includes a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Loyola Marymount University, a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Texas, El Paso, and a PhD in Public Policy from the University of Texas, Austin. She is a registered professional engineer, first-generation college graduate, and daughter of an immigrant. She is bilingual and bicultural. Our second panelist is Paloma Aguirre, who serves as mayor at large for the city of Imperial Beach. Mayor Aguirre is a first-generation Mexican-American. She was born in San Francisco, California, and lived there until she was eight years old. Her family then moved to Mexico, where she spent the rest of her formative years. Mayor Aguirre represents the city of Imperial Beach on the San Diego Community Power Board of Directors and as an alternate on the Metropolitan Transit System Board. She also serves as Speaker, Speaker Anthony Rendon's San Diego Post appointee on the California Coastal Commission and as Governor Newsom's appointee to the Good Neighbor Environmental Board an independent federal advisory committee, which advises the president and Congress on good neighbor practices along the US border with Mexico. Mayor Aguirre holds a BA in psychology from the University of San Diego and a master's of advanced studies in marine biodiversity and conservation from Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UCSD. Our third panelist, Mackenzie Elmer has been the environmental and energy reporter for Voice of San Diego since March of 2020. She has written extensively about the environmental crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. Prior to Voice of San Diego, she was a freelance writer at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She was also the assistant program coordinator for the Climate Science and Policy Program at Scripps. She has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Iowa, where she studied journalism, and a Master's in Climate Science and Policy from UCSD. Welcome, all of you. Commissioner Hener, let's begin with you about our transboundary trans pollution problem and its history. You're muted, Commissioner. There we go. Uh, thank you, ladies, for the introduction, Ruth. Um, and I really want to recognize the uh, League of Women Voters and the noble work that you do. You, you have been a great guidance to me every time I go vote. Um, and so I really appreciate that. So it's really a great honor for me to be here. So my heart goes to all of you. What I wanted to start with and um, was to share a little a map. I'm an engineer, so there's nothing like a map, right? To kind of lay out what the problem is. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen and I hope you can see this map that I have up here. I'm not gonna project it because I'm afraid I'm gonna lose it. But here is, uh, what you see here is the US Mexico, okay? And oh, I don't know why it's doing this. And um, and we have here the Tijuana River like over into Imperial Beach into the into the estuary. And so what's happening right now is
when it's treated in Mexico, um, I'm not sure, can you still see my map? No, your map is gone, but just carry on. Okay, so so when it's treated in Mexico, um, so I'll just go back here. Um, it's treated in Mexico, it flows into the Tijuana River. At the same time, we have a wastewater treatment plant um, that takes wastewater from the city of, of Tijuana and that wastewater is, is treated at our plant. And then there's another wastewater treatment plant on the coast. Um, I think it's about 30 miles south of the border and it's called San Antonio de los Buenos. That wastewater treatment plant in Mexico is not working right now. So that's one issue. The second issue that we have is that there's a wastewater line that would take wastewater from the city of Tijuana to San Antonio de los Buenos, and that collapsed in July, in June of 20, or July of 2022. So because of that, there's, we lost that pipe. And so therefore, wastewater started to flow to our wastewater treatment plant and to the river. And so therefore, we have an issue right now of excess flows going into our plant and the IBWC's wastewater treatment plant right now is not meeting water quality standards. And we also have flows of wastewater going into the Tijuana River um, because of this broken pipe. Um, and those are flowing directly into the estuary and unfortunately are affecting the beaches of, of Imperial Beach and, and, um, and also Coronado Beach. So that is the history and the problem of what we're having. Of course, there's a, a longer history before that, and I'm sure my colleagues will be able to talk about that, but I'm focusing on the history related to what our role is at the IBWC and the issues that we have right now. Um, but we do have a plan to address them. And so at some point I'll be able to share that. Thank you. Mayor Aguirre. Thank you very much. So um, as Commissioner Hiner said, the impacts from this pollution are severe and vast. Um, the city of Imperial Beach's main shoreline has been closed every single day this year. The southern end portion of our town uh, has been closed for over 700 days, consecutive days. We're approaching 800. And the impacts extend not just in, in, to Imperial Beach, but to Silver Strand State Beach and Coronado. And I just want to also mention that the beaches uh, south of the border are also affected, right? Playas de Tijuana, all the way down to Rosarito. So um, the the history in our work with with the commission with IBWC is 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 longstanding, and um, and I'm very appreciative of having Commissioner Hiner now at the helm because her expertise and experience. In we didn't talk about this, but. She used to lead the Border Environmental Cooperation Commission, which is an agency that is now within the North American Development Bank. So she's very familiar with all the cross-border pollution um, uh, you know, impacts to our region. Uh, but before her, her time at the commission, it was quite challenging to deal with the commission. And I'll just share just for uh, background sake, that the city of Impro Beach, along with the city of Chula Vista, the port of San Diego, and uh, lately, the, later, the state of California entered into litigation against IBWC, which, um, in our opinion, uh, prompted uh, our uh, Congress to appropriate $300 million to uh, expand the capacity of the International Wastewater Treatment Plant in San Isidro that the commissioner ref referred to earlier. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into the details of where that is. There's a lot of questions around that, and there's a lot of questions about the additional funding that's ha that has been recently requested and the prognosis of that funding. So uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Aguirre. Okay, Mackenzie. Let's hear from Hi. you. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's really cool that the commissioner and um, Mayor Aguirre are here to talk about this. So I, I'll, I'll come from like a journalistic perspective, obviously, having covered this only for uh, a couple of years, and I'm sure um, the mayor and the commissioner can jump in with a lot more knowledge, but you asked about the history. And so just in my studying of this problem, it, it seems to date back to like 
even the 1940s where, you know, we were, um, or even prior to that, you know, we were drawing the border first, um, and it, this this problem has kind of been a function of not only um, of geography of, of of where the border has been drawn and the actual topography of the land there and what that means for sewage and wastewater and just between two large cities um, that are uh, divided by a border, um, but also uh, the just sheer growth um, of the city of Tijuana over the years, which started uh, after World War II and, you know, development happened at a really rapid pace. And so um, I always like to talk about that to start to just explain that, you know, the city of Tijuana um, has grown so fast and per perhaps with not the type of permitting you might expect on the US side. So, you know, buildings are built, houses maybe are built or residences are built and haven't perhaps had the proper connections to like a traditional wastewater system. I mean, this really is truly like wastewater talk. It's like talking plumbing and pipes and all that good stuff, um, you know, and it's just sort of built up as a over time of uh, more and more people creating more and more sewage. And and that um, by nature of gravity has just sort of flows, uh, you know, flows down over the border. And so um, I think it was- Mackenzie, was it, can I yeah. ask you to slow down just a little bit for our interpreters? Oh, I'm sorry. I even wrote slow down on a huge letters on a piece of paper and I totally ignored that. Okay. I can slow down, yes. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Sorry, sorry to uh, our Spanish speaking friends watching today. I spoke far too quickly. Um, and so I, I guess I was just trying to talk about a little bit you know, more history that led us up to this problem. And uh, I think I left off just saying that, um, you know, in the, the, the city of Tijuana had grown so much that um, there was a lot of sewage being generated and potentially wasn't able to be treated um, as quickly as it could make its way um, into the Tijuana River and across the border. And so in 1990, I believe, Commissioner, please correct me, the first international treatment plant was built on the US side to handle all of some of the sewage for the city of Tijuana. So by function, it's basically a piece of the city of Tijuana um, and it's joint, it was jointly built by both countries money and maintained that way. Um, and now we're at a point where the, the city of Tijuana has grown and grown. Climate change has caused heavier rains and more sewage um, and water to be um, present in this system. And so we're at a point now where the system seems to be overloaded and also the infrastructure on the Tijuana side per has perhaps not been uh, kept up and fixed and replaced at a rate that is necessary. And so that seems to be like how I like to describe the, the history of where we are today. But hey, jump in and correct me. <laughs> Uh, we've got a little bit of time. Um, Commissioner or Mayor Aguirre, would you like to add anything to that? So, so, so um, Mayor, if you want to go first, if not, I can I can add a couple of things to that. You can go first. I know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so just to add something to what uh, Mackenzie, you did a great, even though you spoke so fast. Um, you you did a great job of explaining really the history. I think we actually should have started with you now in hindsight, right? Uh, but to add to Mackenzie's point is, is that you're right, Tijuana has grown tremendously. And let me tell you, up until maybe a few, a couple of, um, I'd say 2015, when we really started to have a real issue with these transboundary flows, they were a leader from a utility management perspective. They were the only um, community along the border that near, had nearly, you know, over 90% of their population um, with wastewater treatment because they actually had three wastewater treatment plants at that time. They built um, their first one, I think sometime in the, I wanna say in the seventies or eighties, and then two more, they built in um, in about 2010, and our plant, our international plant, was built in 1997 to handle some of that flow as well. So, so it's it's been a collaborative effort between the two countries, um, in, in addressing this and recognizing that it's a shared problem, and we work towards 
we're working towards a, a shared solution. Um, the other thing I'd like to add um, with Mayor Aguirre's uh, comment is that the relationship between the public and the IBWC, like she said, was very, very contentious for a number of years. Um, and, and so um, my, my approach has been, this is probably like the seventh stakeholder engagement meeting that I've had where I've had the opportunity to share what the plans are of the IBWC, because I feel that the it's up to the public to hold us accountable, and 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 that history of of not being not sharing that type of information at the IBWC is is one of the things that I've been really proud that we as not myself but also with the support of staff have really pivoted the agency towards and and so because of that um, I, I think it 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 really becomes uh, an opportunity for for the coalition building that's done to help, you know, advance um, the funding that's been necessary for this project. And I'll just add that um, the, I, th I think it all really stemmed from the free trade agreement, the original free trade agreement that was signed in 1994, I believe, um, that attracted a lot of um, people from all over Latin America in, seek, in search of jobs in Tijuana. So that pressure really um, was made evident in the, even though they have the 90% coverage of infrastructure, it's infrastructure as we all have witnessed and experienced that's outdated and insufficient, right? And because they have a combined stormwater and sewage infrastructure system that this entire city was built over, you every time it rains, you have those, those um, uh, pipelines or pipes or conveyance systems or manholes, whatever, collapse, and then you have the, the added sewage spills and the increased sewage. That's one and two is the unregulated neighborhoods in Tijuana, the, the unofficial neighborhoods that are not really even connected to that 90% coverage that the commissioner uh, mentioned, that's also an additional and exacerbating factor in this entire equation. Uh, so to a certain degree, there is almost a shared responsibility um, when it comes to the negative externality that was created from that original free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. And just to add something to what Paloma commented on, almost every Fortune 500 company has facilities on the on the on the Mexican side, right? And so, and so that that is because of the of the opportunity to combine um, technology and labor in Mexico is what makes televisions and 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 vehicles so such a power. I mean, to be able to compete with other regions of the world this symbiotic relationship is really important. And I think from a environmental standpoint, that's another um, concern, I believe of, you know, we don't, be, because there's so much industry on the other side of the border, there's um, just a booming population. Well, we don't really know what kind of pollutants are necessarily in the water that is making its way over the border that the plant has to handle that eventually finds its way into the Tijuana Valley and, and, and into the Pacific Ocean once it's treated or not treated. Um, so that that seems to always be um, a, a concern and, and something that's kind of hard or hasn't been tracked well. And I just wanted to also note that though I've only covered this for a few years, it was, you know, I've only covered it for two commissioners. This is quite a, um, a feat that we have the IBWC commissioner and the mayor of Imperial Beach like here and talking like, in a public a forum. I mean, this is this is common of Commissioner Hiner's like style. It's very clear and, and obviously Mayor Aguirre, but in the administration past, um, you know, basically the, the the wastewater treatment plant that we're now like much more aware of is is also on the US side is struggling to work. Um, that was in lockdown. Like you didn't get a tour of the plant. Now I think the League of Women Voters has even seen on um, the inside of that plant. So it, it has been um, quite an about face, it seems, since the litigation has dropped and we've had a lot more uh, open dialogue. Mm, interesting. Thank you. That's a really great point to to bring up. 
anybody want to say anything? One last comment on this uh, this part of it. Okay, then let's uh, carry on with current politics and funding issues, both present and future. Commissioner Haneri, why don't you begin again? Okay, so um, so the, uh, I mentioned the problem for the IBWC. Um, Paloma, Mayor Aguirre talked about from a city perspective, and then and then and 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 Mackenzie talked about um, the the perspective from you know the public journalistic perspective, right? So I'm going to still focus on what is the politics and the funding related to the IBWC perspective, right? Um, so as I mentioned in the history, the the right now we have a non-compliant plan, okay? Um, and we've been self-reporting. We've been working with the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board with our permit. And so right, so that's a piece of the politics, right? And not too long ago, I had the opportunity to share with the board how, what we are doing to get back in compliance. Um, and so we've redirected um, $18 million of our, of our funding to this project. Now, one of the reasons this plant, like I mentioned, was non-compliant was one, because of the excess flows, but two, also because of the lack of maintenance that was given to the plant over, you know, from 2000 to 2010, only about $4 million was invested in this plant. And that's really unacceptable for a, a wastewater treatment plant that's probably valued at, you know, five, you know, 300, 400 million dollars, right? You know, it's like having your home, you have to, you know, have money, you have to fix the roof, you've got to, you know, fix all of the, the broken sprinklers and all of those pieces. And so when you're not doing that, stuff starts to accumulate. So the non-compliance, you know, came. And then of course, Tropical Storm Hillary already exacerbated a, a vulnerable plant. Um, but we, what we're working on right now, so we have full funding to get our plant back in compliance. And um, we have a plan. It's out for public comment with the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, what all of the steps are going to be uh, go um, into it. And so we're targeting uh, to have it back in compliance by August of 2024. But we're going to see incremental, incremental um, uh, um, improvements in that. Okay, so that's that's one of the 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 things that we're working on. And the politics is our permit, working with um, the um, the the um, the regional water quality control board. Now, the other piece, the the re, the full expansion of the plant plant. So right, um, EPA um, was granted the authority to do an analysis to see what needs to be done to reduce the transboundary flows um, into the Tijuana River by 90% back in 2021. They received $300 million under the U United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. And so what they did was they did a study that said, I think you froze, Commissioner. Oh. Okay, there you're back. Okay, sorry. Right. The expansion of the plant um, goes to 50 MGD, but to do that, we have to have um, some rehabilitation at the wastewater treatment plant. So one of the issues is, is that we have $300 million, but the cost to do all of that work is $600 million, right? So we have a delta or our project exceeds the, the funding available by about 300 million. So obviously this caused a lot of angst, especially since um, in order to expand the plant, it was identified that um, between 150, about 150 and 180 million dollars worth of rehabilitation needs was gonna be needed for this plant. And so the question became, what, where, how did we get here? How is this a, a problem, right? So all of this coalition building, all of this outrage, because living in these conditions is unacceptable. Um, and all of this outrage um, and letter writing campaign and your members of Congress really coalesced around this issue. And so that's the politics. They met. Um, 
they were talking to the administration. So when you have all of these sides talking to the administration, it's like having a husband, you know, your husband doesn't listen to you, but he'll listen to everybody else around you, right? And, and so it helps, right? And so and so all of that coalition building, um, um, the administration now in a supplemental has inc included 310 million to add to the pot of money so that we can build a 50 MGD plant and upgrade the plant so it's not so vulnerable as it is now. And so that is kind of the, the, the story behind the politics and the, and, the, and the funding. Now there's a third piece to all of this, right? Because part of the mix, like, as I showed earlier, part of the infrastructure issues are in Mexico, right? And so one of the things that um, we negotiated my first year I was at the IBWC is a minute. A minute is a tool. We are the only entity in the world that shares a binational watershed that has this tool of a minute. Or in Spanish, it's called una acta. I don't know if the, how the interpreters are interpreting it, but una acta. And so this minute tool, um, is, is how we negotiate with Mexico a binding agreement on addressing an issue. And we have uh, 329 minutes. This one was 320, minute 328, minute three, 328. So this minute, in this minute, the Mexican federal government obli was obligated to invest $144 million in Mexico. That $144 million is a lot of money in Mexico. And they have already secured one third of that amount of money. And, and why is that important? Because in Mexico, construction funding is only good for one year. So it would not be helpful for them to have all of the, very different from the United States. We wanna get the full 600 million, but on the Mexican side, it's really important that they get money every year to do this because if they, it's a use or lose. So right now, the fact that they have a third of the funding for that first tranche of projects has to do a lot with the politics. Mayor Aguirre meets with the state of, of Baja California. Um, we meet with the state of Baja California and the federal government. So all of this coalition building as well also brings light to the issue in Mexico, which then leads to attention to the issue and you know funding going into that. So that's my perspective from the history perspective and the and the politics. I mean the politics and the funding. Thank you. Mayor Giddy, your take on current politics and funding issues. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the exciting part of this conversation, right? I just want to give a little bit more of history and background. Um, as, as Commissioner Keener was speaking, I was uh, reminiscing of, um, we were all active in my past life as an advocate. We were actively involved in minute, the development of Minute 320, which was, I think, signed in 2012. And... Um, Commissioner, the commissioner referenced the lack of maintenance, operation and maintenance funding back then. That was one of the things that a group of us, a coalition of stakeholders constantly advocated for, both when I was part of that Minute 320 working group and as co-chair of the IBWC Citizens Forum Board, which um, we were constantly advocating for increased operation, uh, O&M, operation and maintenance funding from the agency itself. And that never happened in the past, um, you know, couple of, of uh, administrations of the, of the IBWC. Uh, so to Commissioner Keener's point, she did inherit basically a, a plant that is in, in severe need of, of rehabilitation, right? And the fact that, that, that she's reallocating these internal, I think you said $18 million, right? Um, the fact that she is allocating these $18 million from internal uh, funding, um, I think that speaks volumes, right? But the challenge is it's it's not enough, as she pointed out. Uh, half of the original $300 million that were secured, secured through the USMCA agreement are now are going to go to fix the plan. So that's where we're, we, we are in the state of, okay, 
We all coalesce. There are all these stakeholders that raise their voices, all 18 mayors in this county of San Diego, every single state legislator, every congressional representative, federal congressional representative advocate, all the nonprofits uh, advocating for increased funding. And thankfully, the um, President Biden did include the additional $310 million request in his emergency supplemental funding bill. But the 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 exciting or ugly part of this conversation is it's dependent on congressional appropriations and that has been the journey since i can remember working on this issue it's every two years it's the subject being sub subject to congressional appropriations um approval and sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. And that could be a factor of why not enough funding went to the plant. Um, something we haven't talked about is the so are the sources of funding that IBWC can receive funding from. It is funded through um, the Department of State and the Department of State has limitations on the type of funding it can receive. Uh, for example, it cannot. It is ineligible for uh, the uh, funding from the infrastructure bill or any other source of funding that could be made available. I know that Congressman Peters has introduced uh, a bill uh, to, as they refer, refer to it, to have a legislative fix and uh, remove that that barrier. Um, but again, it's subject to the congressional approval process. So that is the challenge. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge before we run out of time that the situation is the worst it has ever been. And that's the perspective that we, uh, that I bring because that's what my community is experiencing, right? Not just now in Pearl Beach, but all of South San Diego, the communities of Nestor and uh, San Isidro and, and, and all the way to Chula Vista now. So we can get more into the details of the health and environmental health impacts, but the bottom line is that the funding is, um, the, the sources of funding are insufficient. The funding itself is insufficient. We are in years and years of arrears of catching up to where we need to be. And I, I saw a question in the chat, someone was saying, well, what's it gonna take for us to have clean water? And that's that's the, billion dollar question, right? Because estimates put this comprehensive solution at anywhere between $900 million and $1.2, $1.5 billion, which is a drop in the bucket for the, um, you know, the budget that the president has put out for this and next year's fiscal year. So I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you, Mayor Aguirre. And now we know that the bacteria in the water can become airborne so that complicates the issue even further. A reminder to everybody to please speak slowly. And Mackenzie, let's get your take on current politics, funding issues, present and future. Thank you for reminding me to speak slowly. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, there's there's a lot of things we could, we could touch on. I think um, just a lot of members of the public get a little confused about this like funding issue um, because you know, 2020, when I first started working on this story, everyone was in celebration mode because the Trump administration had, uh, get or Congress had gotten $300 million uh, for some, you know, some to build something new to treat more sewage um, and reduce the problem from where it's at right now. And that was, you know, celebrated and that chunk of money was given to the Environmental Protection Agency to do a big study and decide, you know, where are we going to spend this money to really reduce the sewage flows and clean up the beaches along the Southern California coast. And, you know, they did that. They decided we're going to build an expanded plant. We're going to build a bigger and better plant and more sewage, and it's going to be great. And then uh, kind of all of a sudden, it seemed, we learned like through that process, um, sort of, and at the end, by the time that they had picked this project they were going to do, we learned that the, the plant that exists today, as we've been talking about, actually has uh, 
some very expensive, you know, backed up maintenance that it needs um, some spending on too. So, um, and that was actually a question I, not to put the commissioner on the spot, but, you know, I think a lot of people have a question about like, well, why didn't we know about the state of the plant until now, until after EPA had done its study, until after we had celebrated the funding, it seems um, that kind of came up after the fact. Not to take a question in the role and here, I can, but <laughs> I can add add something to that because that's a question I get a lot. And that's not, and then the other thing is how are we going to prevent this moving forward? Right. Yeah. So this agency, um, when I so between 2010 and 2020, um, the agency was only receiving between about 26 million to 33 million a year for the entire border um, to maintain its infrastructure. And we have two wastewater treatment plants. We have two major dams. We have five diversion dams. We have two ports of entry. Um, and we have 800 boundary markers and 500 miles of levees to maintain. It doesn't take a lot to really come to a conclusion that 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 level of funding is not sufficient. Okay. The other thing that this agency does not have, which we're working on, is there's no proactive maintenance system in place. And those are usually called asset management systems, where every year you have a plan for what you're going to fix that year. So in a wastewater treatment plant, some things will last for three years, some things will last for seven years, some pieces or components as we call them will last for 20 years, right? But you can't, you don't know unless you have it inventoried and, and um, evaluated. This agency doesn't have any of that infrastructure um, inventoried and evaluated except now the wastewater treatment plan in San Diego. Okay, and that was because when I got, I arrived at the agency, we still were not authorized to receive those 300 million, but we, I said, we are going to start doing a condition assessment on that plant. So we started doing that in parallel to the EPA's environmental process. And so that's when we found out and, and we started getting early numbers in May of, of, of 2023 of, of the level of rehabilitation needs. And we made that public a month later because we had to really quality control these numbers because we knew it was going to be a shock. And I wanted to make sh for sure that it was that value, not more, not less, but it was that value. So, so how are we going to avoid this moving forward? So there are three legacy documents that I'm working on as commissioner. I get a lot of, I get a lot of questions from member of Congress. How much do you need to run all of this infrastructure? And I, I can give them an educated uh, guesstimate, but science is what's going to tell you. So we're doing a manpower study that's going to be done this summer that's going to benchmark us against other infrastructure agencies. And like Paloma mentioned, we are a unique agency because we fall under Department of State, but we're a domestic agency as well. And so when there's money for domestic issues, IBWC never gets pulled into this discussion like the Corps of Engineers or the Bureau of Reclamation. But we're going to do a manpower study that's going to benchmark us against those two agencies. We're, we're, we, and we've awarded that contract. That's going to be done in, in, um, in May, I mean, in the summer. And, and the other one is we've just awarded a contract on doing an asset management plan and system. Okay. That's going to help us manage proactively and be able to tell stakeholders like yourselves and members of Congress, this is how much money we need to maintain this infrastructure. And then the third thing that we're going to do that we do not have is a capital plan, a capital plan that goes out for 20 years on what are the needs of the agency. Paloma, I'm sure you've got a capital plan as a city. That is a typical um, tool. We don't have that here. And I've been asked why? Well, you know, there's all kinds of opinions that can come with that, right? But right now the, the, the reality is we do not. 
And I'm hoping that many of you now will hold this agency accountable on the importance of having these tools. Thank you. Mackenzie, did you want to follow up with anything? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering my, my question. Uh, sorry to take that away from you there, Ruth. <laughs> That's my uh, job. But it's hard. It, yeah, it's hard to sit back as a reporter and not ask questions. But um, uh, that's interesting, and it, it's good information to have. Um, it, it, I interpret what you said as, and this is my interpretation, that it sounds like you inherited an agency where there was, I don't know exactly, I don't, I don't have the facts, but it seems like a lot of issues were ignored or weren't addressed for a very long time. I mean, the three things you mentioned seem like pretty basic, uh, you know, sort of like laundry lists of things that you need to have in order to run a functioning wastewater treatment plant or government or, you know, just government agency. Um, and so to me, that sounds like there was some pretty bad oversight potentially by administration's past, or there's just such complexity in the way that the IBWC exists as like a federal agency and under which department that you have to answer to and ask for money for. And I've noticed in covering this, like there's a lot of just nuts and bolts that need to be figured out through the legislative progress process in Congress, which is, as we know, like an extremely arduous thing. Um, and so it's taken like a lot of screaming from the locals to get the attention of the Congress members to then get, you know, things passed that, you know, for instance, IBWC, like she said, she can't take money for her agency from anywhere else. Like even if Governor Newsom brought, you know, a billion dollars on a golden platter potentially and offered it to the IBWC for fixing the plant, they can't take it is my understanding, you know, in, in simple, simple terms. Um, so it and I think what we didn't we haven't talked about and I wonder if anyone wants to get into it but just like in covering a bit of the politics in Mexico it gets even more complicated um you know they that's a whole different country the U.S. can't just go in and tell Mexico what to do to fix its wastewater system and um I've teamed up um at Voice of San Diego with a, a 30-year journalist in Tijuana um, Vicente Calderon and we've been writing stories in both English and Spanish, trying to like talk to both sides of the border about this problem. And what I've learned is, you know, uh, new administrations come in um, in Baja California, new governors come in, they appoint new, sometimes they appoint all new people at the different agencies that are in charge of wastewater um, uh, in, in different like, you know, regular uh, positions, they become sort of politicized positions. Instead of just appointing an engineer, you might have a political appointee who's running the wastewater system, someone who might not know exactly how to do that position. Um, this is something that I ran into when I was covering water in Ensenada. Um, but, and then often, you know, people will be replaced um, and it's hard for those relationships between the US and Mexico and jump in if I'm wrong, um, sometimes to like maintain uh, just the knowledge base necessary and the communication between both sides of the border to try to just like even, you know, keep track of what's broken over there. What are you guys working on? You know, what uh, what might be leaking, et cetera, just like basic uh, communication about this sort of shared wastewater system that we have across these two countries. Yeah, I, I imagine that there, uh, several questions about that in the chat. We have a host of questions. And if you all don't mind, I'd just like to jump into them a little bit early so we can get as many answered as possible. Uh, Rosette, would you like to start with the first question? Yes, thank you, Jack. Uh, there are uh, so many questions and some of them you've, um, Commissioner Hiner and uh, Mayor Aguirre have already, um, kind of answered, um, but one, several questions about the kinds of pollution and the toxins that are being discharged into the, into the area and concern about what is being done to monitor that, what is being done to uh, ameliorate that, what is being done 
uh, what can the IBWC do, um, and do they have any 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 plans or any systems in place to um, respond to that? Um, so, so and 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 what I could do, Rosette, um, there there's if there's questions that you feel we would like you would like for us to answer, if you would like to send them to us, we can give you an official response, and you can post on your web page um, to that. Um, because we've had this question posed to us before with regards to certain uh, classes of pollutants. Um, we we are we are uh, our discharge permit is monitored by the San Diego County Water Con Water Quality Control um, District, and that permit um, monitors thirty five parameters, and so one of the toxins that has been brought up before when we would look back at our, our our discharge we did not see see that and so i'm going to have to go back and look at that again but we do have an extensive monitoring we we spend over a million dollars a year just in monitoring uh, the waters in the ocean and our discharge is not um has been has not been to the level, and, and this is one of the things that I wish um, um, David Gibson was on because he has a lot more institutional memory with regards to this, but my understanding is that our discharge is not bringing those types of pollutants to the to the beach. Those uh, PCBs, I think, were some of the ones that had come up, right? Um, and so, but we can, I can give you a, a more written um, response to that where we more look at the history uh, of that, but we do, we are required in our permit, just to be clear, to monitor all of the discharges and to report on them, and we continue to do that. And I, I think the concern is what is being done to mitigate the right. Of those right. Topics. And so and so the mitigation is precisely the work that we're doing right now to clean out our sedimentation tanks, to uh, re replace some of our pumps, to bring redundancy to some of our systems. Right. So that we don't have these vulnerabilities exposed anymore. And so those are the major things. And so like um, like I commented, the the uh, the San Diego Re Regional Water Quality Control Board does have our plan and schedule out for public comment right now, um, and I believe it's probably going to be closing pretty soon. But those are the steps that we're taking. The other thing is is that the Coastal Commission, uh, the California Coastal Commission, has put us on their agenda uh, on a, as a standing uh, topic for us to be reporting every month how we're advancing the compliance to our permit. I promise you that at the next one, I'm going to show where the improvements are in which uh, in which uh, parameters so that people have more confidence in, in how the water quality is improving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's a, a question. Uh, does the IBWC plan to take in to consideration future recycled water production processes during the preliminary design phase of the core projects. So that water is owned by the Mexican federal government. And so right now, if there was an entity that was interested in that water, we would, and it would be either in the United States or to take that water and cross it back into Mexico to use in Mexico. It would be uh, how we would work with the Mexican government to, to, to agree that this is how that water is going to be used. What I will tell you is, is that the, uh, the wastewater treatment, the improvements to the wastewater treatment plant and the expansion will produce a better quality water than what's there now. So obviously, if there is an interest in taking it to recycling, that's something they could do. Right now, for our purposes, we do not have the funding to take it to the to a potable water or a ter tertiary treatment level at this time. Can I, can I add something to that as well? Um, the, I, the ironic thing is that there's two, the two sewage treatment plants that the commissioner referenced earlier, which are Tura Herrera and La Morita, which are on, are on the eastern side of the city of Tijuana, are producing uh, treated wastewater effluent 
clean enough to be used for irrigation. Their plan had been to, you know, recycle it, put in purple pipe and use it to irrigate green spaces in Tijuana. That's been one of the primary recommendations that we've been making is that they use that recycled water. And I say it's ironic because it's now being discharged into the, um, the, the river channel and it's serving as a vehicle of conveyance of this pollution. I, I saw in the chat somewhere there was a question about why is there now year round flow uh, in addition to the major storm events we've had. It's because those roughly 18 million gallons of treated effluent are going into the into the main Tijuana River channel. So if if that water were to be recycled or redirected, for example, to the Rodriguez Dam, which is right across the the you know freeway there, um, that could be um, solve two two issues: a water supply issue and a reduction in our conveyance of pollution that is impacting our beaches. I just wanted to add a little point on that. Um, I wrote a couple stories about this question. Um, so my understanding was um, in order to recycle that water, you really need to know the a lot more about the point sources of, of what's potentially polluting it. And that's um, a hard question to answer on the, uh, the Tijuana side of the border. So there, you know, and the other, the travesty of this also is that um, the city of Tijuana relies 100% on the Colorado River for its water sources. And so uh, we know how badly that um, that river is hit by drought. And um, we already know too, from other reporting we've done that Tijuana, Ensenada, other cities in Baja California, sorry, I should speak slower, are uh, <laughs> uh, often experiencing water shutoffs or tondeos. And so th this is uh, this idea of recycling this water has been raised by companies, by you know Mexican officials themselves want to do this, but um, you know I don't think there's been any real uh, movement forward on that on that issue. I even asked I think the EPA if if uh, you know that water could be part water recycling could be part of the the plan, and I'm not sure if it's part of the longer term vision that the EPA produced in that laundry list of projects, but um, Tijuana could, you know, desperately needs new water sources and so recycling it instead of dumping it into, you know, treated water like uh, Mayor Aguirre just said, dumping that into the Pacific Ocean would be a much better use, clearly. Thank you. We've got quite a few questions about other toxic chemicals as well as the sewage that's being pumped into the Tijuana River. And uh, here's one, uh, Commissioner Henner, will the plant treat these other toxic chemicals once the plant's repaired or will these pollutants continue to be passed through and dumped into the Pacific? And I'd have to look at that list of what they're saying because I feel that there's some disinformation with regards to these uh, these toxic chemicals as to whether they're really coming through our plant or not. Um, so if you could send me those, I would rather have my environmental area sit down and look at them and, and that because they're the experts on this. Obviously, I don't know, uh, you know, about every single one of these um, types sure. of. I'm not a chemist. I'm a, I'm a policy. I'm a policy person, and so I, not that I'm 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 belitt belittling their comments, but I I would like to if you could put all of those together for me, I'd like to have that opportunity to provide written comments to you. Okay, thank you. So there are a number of questions in the chat and the Q and A about um, funding about trying. I mean, obviously, you've pointed out, um, and Mackenzie also, and maybe it was Mayor Aguirre, uh, I think it was Mayor Aguirre who pointed out that we're looking at potentially a, a billion dollar um, uh, problem here. And uh, so a number of people have asked about um, other funding sources and maybe um, trying to get funding from all of these corporations who are on the other side of the, these Fortune 500 companies. Um, what pressure has been brought uh, on them? Is, is that a possibility or even uh, a fee-based sort of thing like um, it happens at Otay Mesa uh, to help fund it, uh, infrastructure? And then uh, one person in particular said, what can we do as citizens to try and, you know, what do we do to help you get the funding um, that is needed to address this situation? So it's kind of a two-part question, if you will. 
Right. So, so definitely the coalition building is really critical um, to advance the attention on this and the need for the funding. Um, and, and there are areas of the country that get a constant stream of funding for cleanup, like the Chesapeake Bay is the one that's referred to quite a bit, right? They get, you know, you know, millions and millions and tens of millions of and probably even hundreds of millions of dollars every year um, to, to, they recognize that area as an area of, of common interest, but also as a programmatic area. The Tijuana River doesn't have a program for it. And, you know, the estuary is a really important um, environmental amenity for, you know, the, the, for the nation. And so really learning, uh, for me, I think a good strategic approach would be to start right now, we're, we're addressing kind of the urgent matters, but really, at, you know, broadening the conversation to one of um, looking at it from the perspective of, of a program where there's a constant stream of money um, to help address this, I think is going to be a good way to have that, that to address that need. Because like Paloma and Mackenzie mentioned, this is a billion dollar project, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, need in the area. I mean, we haven't even talked about cleaning up the sediment in the estuary from all of the stormwater, right? Stormwater is gonna be all the time. Right, and so there's got to be a stream of money to help with this, and so I think I think um, the question is is that what can we do? Well, starting to advocate for that type of of, of, of program, and again, you know, coming, at, you know, having the leadership like the state of California to think about uh, this region as a a a region that needs this support. That that would be my. My best. And no one's more interested than should be no more interested than the state of California. This is this is the California amenity of, of the estuary. It's such a beautiful beautiful place to yeah. to have. And I'll add to that if that's okay. Um, I think that to that point, it's it's yes, it's a it's a state amenity. Um, and it's also a state crisis, right? That's why putting on my coastal commissioner hat, the the commission has. Pri prioritized it at the highest level, right? We sent a letter to the president, a letter to the governor, and a letter to Secretary Blinken from the Department of State, not only asking them to prioritize the issue, the funding, but also to eventually ask for an emergency declaration. That's why I've been calling for an emergency declaration, because I know that potentially it's, and, and Commissioner has, has talked about this in the past, at this point, the bidding and procurement process, suspending that, the rules for that, wouldn't make much of a difference or move the needle because that's already happening, but it would send a very clear message to Congress that this is beyond just, oh, something that needs O&M or something that's standard, like clean, cleaning up the estuary. This is a public health emergency where we're having impacts to people just breathing in the polluted air, right? So uh, that's why we continue to push for that. In addition, again, if the there would be a legislative change that would allow the IBWC to receive funding from other sources, that's also going to take years and years through the congressional process. That's why we've been calling for the state of emergency so that all of those processes can be suspended. This can be prioritized at the red alert level that it needs to be prioritized to. And eventually long term, right? it can receive the appropriate funding so that it could be, there can be ongoing maintenance, right? Um, that's that's the medium to long-term, but right now it's, it's we're in triage. We're talking about, you know, the analogy could be of someone who's literally had their aorta and it's bleeding out, right? And and, and I, not to be too graphic, but it's, it's the level of urgency that I, as mayor of the city of Imperial Beach and as a representative of the San Diego Coast on the Coastal Commission are, are calling for. And, and Ruth, just let me just add one thing to what Paloma heard because she's been an excellent advocate and has had a, she's a, a, the best strategist I've met when it comes to this because it's, it's I think she's, she's got a great approach and she's right spot on. When, when she talks about us not being able to receive funding, it's, it's what they call in Congress contributed funding authority. 
uh, you as an agency cannot spend more money than what Congress authorizes you. But other agencies like the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation, which I highlight because they're similar agencies to us and what they operate, they do have that authority. So it's a tool so that we could, they can receive funds from other sources so that they can help maintain the infrastructure they're, 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 in, they're interested to maintain. And that's what um, we're, we're seeking to request. President Biden's budget did have that in there. And right now it's with Congress and um, going through various committees to get that authorized so that we can have that contributed funding authority. Let me Make, just like, if, sure. can I just take a quick second? Like, absolutely. This is um, such a unique way to run uh, like a sewage treatment plant, right? Like normally <laughs> your, your sewage goes to the city or the whatever, and you're paying through your rates, you're paying through your bills to keep those, uh, that infrastructure, you know, functioning and working. We have to go through Congress to get just a bit of money to like fix a piece of what's wrong at the plant. Like this is how incremental this particular like structure is like it's just it, it's kind of wild when we kind of draw it out like that and I think it sounds like it's pretty critical then commissioner to have this change in the legislative like you know process to say oh we can take money from California and then the doors open or from companies you know that are contributing to the problem so this would be like a pretty big fix right am I okay mm -hmm. Well, here's, an, here's another question along that line. Can we work towards a cross-border fee for infrastructure for intra infrastructure similar to SANDAG's OTI Mesa 2 crossing fee for infrastructure for a permanent funding solution? Right. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we work towards that? And who's we? I guess <laughs> who's this we? <laughs> you know, because you have to have a champion like but Mayor Aguirre to 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 set it all up to set up the you know kind of the the institutional infrastructure you need to to create the fee to collect the fee to uh, to go across the border right um, I, I mean I haven't seen it done it, much less across another country. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll let Mayor Aguirre, she's always very creative at finding paths for complicated things like this. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting concept for sure. Um, you know, I, you know, I think Mackenzie made an excellent point earlier about the, 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 the just non-traditional scheme of what we're talking about here, right? How this wastewater treatment is being paid for and all the hoops that have to happen, you know, for it to even receive a modicum amount of funding for maintenance. Uh, but the cross-border fee, I mean, to a certain degree, I, conceptually, theoretically, does it, does it make sense? It could make sense, right? It's, it's, we are, let's not kid ourselves here. We are technically taking the brunt of the cost, right? And and of of funding this treatment plant um, for the benefit of the people of South San Diego, right? That was the reason why it was created in the first place. It's because you know the speed at which um, the promise plant was going to be built in Mexico wasn't happening fast enough, and the impacts were so severe. The plant was built, and it really created a it alleviated the issue for some time, right? I, I have. Uh, a predecessor of mine, Mayor Don, Diane Rose, who said she was part of those efforts. And and she talks about like, yeah, we had relief for some time, but now we're back to where we were, if not worse. Now, um, I think it would be even more complicated to, to charge a fee because some of those monies that are, um, you know, collected at the border and things like that have to go through their own um, appropriations processes and earmarks. I think um, I think theoretically it's interesting. I think it'd be a long uh, process. I think an easier solution would be when whenever the renegotiation of the USMCA agreement is conducted, 
that's where you have the ability to use some of those or leverage some of the wants and needs of each country and bring this into the fold, which is what happened when those original $300 million were secured. Just in hindsight, I wish they would have asked for a bigger pot of money, but it's hard to, as Commissioner said, guesstimate some of the needs when they didn't even have a real assessment of the conditions of the plant, right? So I'll leave it at that. Do we have time for more questions, Ruth? Yes, we do. Um, so there are a, a few questions uh, that are um, asking for a, maybe some more concrete um, information, like is the pipeline that you said collapsed um, to the in, on the Mexican side that is no longer working? Is is there a plan for it to be repaired? And if so, when? What yes. other the other fixes that you're talking about? What's the time frame for that? When can people expect? to see some right. so so the like like mayor aguirre said it's been you know almost or probably over a year that the that certain parts of the beach have been closed there's been other parts that have been got closed you know 700 days right so let's talk first about that pipe that 46 that 42 inch pipe just was uh, has been fixed and is working right now we just got an email out um, to our stakeholders that that has been working for a few days now, okay? We aren't real excited about it and not doing a lot of hoopla over it because we want to make sure it's working um, because they actually built a brand new pipe and they did it in record time. And, and, and the reason it was not done earlier was because you don't, you can't go to Walmart and buy, you know, 46 inch pipe right off the shelf. It had to be ordered, manufactured, and brought over. And so, you know, it took about six months to do that. Now it's built. Um, now it's just started to operate. If that pipe holds and it was built appropriately, again, I, I this is built in a different country, right? Um, we should start seeing improvements. One, one person said, talked about transboundary flows year round. We should be able to see those minimized substantially, okay? Um, so that they're not flowing down to the estuary. And the reason being is because two years ago, we rehabilitated a lift station that was taking all of the, uh, during dry weather with no stormwater, during dry weather, taking the flow out of the Tijuana River out and into, um, San Antonio de los Buenos, which is that other wastewater treatment plant um, about, I guess it's about 30 miles south of the border. Okay. So that is good news. That is good news. Now, the part of the beach that's been closed for 700 days, that's affected because you have, and Playas de Tijuana, all the way down, like um, Mayor Aguirre said, um, down to, you know, past Tijuana. Those parts of the beaches are, are, are impacted by the lack of that wastewater treatment plant that pretty much started to stop, start, stop functioning beginning in 2015 um, when they were starting to be detected that there was something going on in Mexico. So that one, we have been, um, we have been um, notified by the Mexican government that their military, which is kind of the equivalent of the Corps of Engineers, will be um, constructing that wastewater treatment plant. There's very good news with that, particularly uh, one element of that good news is that it, it will secure funding for that wastewater treatment plant. The risk, you know, you know I want to be kind of open about it because I don't want to over promise and under deliver, right? Is that there's an election year coming in Mexico um, coming up this summer. And so that can affect that funding flow that would have gone to the, to the Mexican military to build this. The good news is right now they've started, they've taken possession of the, of the facility. Um, that's pretty, it's pretty much as an operable. They're starting to clean it out, to prepare the site. In the meantime, they're waiting for the funds to come, um, and they could start bidding out the project. They have told now they have told us 
that it's going to be about two years for them to get that done. Um, it is a much smaller plant than ours. It's only going to be 17 MGD and it's a brand new plant. So it doesn't have the complications of the rehabilitation. Um, but we're going to have to keep an eye on it. And we're going to have to, uh, you know, and that's one of the things that I, as the IBWC commissioner under the minute 328 is, you know, we're required to, um, to get from Mexico. What is the status? How things are progressing? And as part of that, we share it at our citizens forum and any other venue um, that has been set up for us to share information with. Can I just add something? Um, that plant, if and when fixed, would eliminate, according to the EPA, 100% of our beach closures during the summer months. So there's been a lot of questions about when can we expect a fix that could greatly improve our water quality during the summer months when we don't experience rainfall and when the Tijuana River is not flowing. Uh, and I would say just in my, if I had to guesstimate or read the tea leaves, I would hope that the fact that there's going to be an election could catalyze this project to be completed faster so that the outgoing president can say, hey, we did this. That that would be my great hope, but it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll leave it at that, thank you. And one other follow-up and correct me if I'm wrong, commissioner, and also forgive me if I, you know, but the 2024 is also an election year for the US and we have, you know, you're appointed by a president. Uh, so we could potentially, you know, hopefully not, uh, because I think everyone agrees that uh, we're enjoying your leadership and uh, transparency so far, but could have a new commissioner at the IBWC. And we can tell by history that that has a great impact on, you know, what we get to know about what's going on at the border. Uh, that That is correct, Mackenzie. I serve at the pleasure of the president. So here's another question. How can every day Imperial Beach and Southern San Diego citizens be the most helpful in trying to get funding and, and continue to get Congress's attention. Contact your Congress members constantly. Contact the chair of the Appropriations Committee, which the leadership right now is under the Republican Party. Uh, the Appropriations Chair needs to hear that this is an emergency that affects not only citizens and residents, but our national security, border patrol and Navy SEALs are being affected as well. So that's, I think, a part of this narrative that a lot of members in Congress that aren't familiar with the border region aren't uh, perhaps seeing or understanding. Um, so that's that's critical. And, and, and Mayor Aguirre is spot on. She is spot on with regards to that. I would add one more thing is, is that there's very supportive uh, California coalition um, that includes those um, whose districts are impacted like Congressman Peters, uh, Congressman Levin, Congressman Vargas, um, uh, Congresswoman Jacobs, um, but California is, has more members of Congress, right? And so also engaging that other members of Congress within California, um, I think is really important as well. Uh, can I just add one to your point about statewide? Yeah. That's a great point because, um, you know, who would have known that we would get the support of the city of Pacifica, which is at the uh, almost like uh, west of San Francisco, the city of Santa Barbara, the board of supervisors of the county of Santa Cruz have all joined in our call for, fi for a fix and to prioritize this and for a state of emergency. So Yes, it's 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 just a matter of getting the word out and reaching out to these members so that they can, you know, be added to our voices, our collective voice. Great, thank you. I don't, Ruth. I'm looking for another question to ask. Do you have one? Oh well, I I, I have a couple. We've got about five more minutes for questions. Um, here's an interesting one. Has anyone contacted Sixty Minutes about this issue? She doesn't remember seeing it, but she, it seems like the kind of thing they would be interested in. Yeah, Leslie Saul did a very, uh, you know, in-depth and comprehensive story. It was um, 
I want to say maybe four or five years ago before COVID. Um, yeah, the 60 Minutes has been aware. Vice News came and did a story as well. Um, but that's the thing. It's it's like a comment, right? The stories come and go and get peak interest and then we're forgotten again. The, the, the work is in the consistency of us raising this issue and raising our collective voices constantly. It's not easy and not for the faint of heart, but it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, the U.S. Border Patrol is building a span, a, a gate across uh, one side of the Tijuana River to the other, just north of the U.S.-Mexico boundary. It runs the risk of flooding downtown Tijuana. Does the IBWC have a say on this? So the, the Tijuana barrier is, is um, out of our purview. Um, it is a, a national security issue. And so our role with CBP is to make sure that it's maintained so that the gates can go up and down. Okay. And so that is one of the things that we do have a memorandum of understanding with CBP on um, in order to ensure that those gates go up if there's a storm and that we don't have that flooding um, and we have testing in place and then we're going to be reviewing that on an annual basis. I could just chime in here because um, mm -hmm. so I did some reporting on that. Um, Commissioner, isn't it true though that um, while these, see the, these projects um, by the Customs and Border Patrol don't have to go through regular environmental reviews. They basically are kind of just free to build. Um, that The IBWC, in my understanding, was like kind of the only agency that they did have to get some approval from in terms of the design. And because you have to, con you guys have to control that area as well. So can you talk about what you did or didn't study or approve with the B Border Patrol on that? So, so whenever anybody um, builds anything on our land or in our floodplain, there is a permit process that has to be gone through to look at two things, obstruction and deflection. And so obstruction and deflection, um, obstruction is if it, you know, it impacts the floodways and, and deflection is if it changes the boundary. In this case, it can't really change the boundary. That's something we have more on the, on the Rio Grande. In the case of obstruction, um, modeling, they provided all of the, the data and the modeling that was, uh, comes associated with that. Um, and so that modeling um, demonstrated that there would be no, um, again, if the gates open, if the gates are you know, working the way they're supposed to work, um, there should be no negative impact. Um, so right now, that is why the memorandum of understanding that includes constant testing of those gates, um, emergency power backup, those are the types of things that we put in there that would be required in order to ensure that it doesn't become an obstruction to the point of, of um, uh, flooding the downtown area. Just to follow up, I think that, um, so the EPA in lieu of, uh, there was some confrontation between Customs and Border Patrol and EPA that I reported on um, because EPA was very concerned about this flooding issue. And especially because even if the gate, so you're talking about if the gates open and we're talking about a huge metal gate that, you know, the CB, the Border Patrol would be responsible for raising and lowering. Um, but, you know, there's just, there's a constant uh, flows, there's trash buildup um, that could be just sitting against that that gate and potentially if you still open the gate, could there not be some obstruction there? So I wondered if you would also just care to comment on that as well. So it's not one big gate, it's a bunch of gates, right? It's I don't remember how many gates it is, right? And so and so part of that is is also maintenance of this area around the gate. Um, so many feet up, uh, upstream and so many feet downstream is part of their obligation and disposal of all of that debris is also part of their obligation. So again, this is all in the MOU. It's available. You know, I, I think you can FOIA it and we'll, we'll be more than happy to share it. Um, but, but really, and, and in that MOU, it does include a piece related to um, um, 
we can update it if we see things aren't working the way that is in a certain fashion. Okay. So maybe the last question, it looks like we have time for one very, very specific. I think maybe the, um, our, our, um, attendees would like to hear. There's a question here. It says in contacting our state and federal elected representatives specifically, what should be our ask? Because there's so many, so many things, right? There's more funding, but there's also changing in funding. Is it an emergency declaration? What should be the ask? Is it one, two, three, is it one thing? Um, can you respond to that? And I would I would suggest the emergency declaration because that would help us bypass a lot of this, these um, slower processes that would get us the help that we needed, uh, that we need uh, faster. Uh, second tier, yes, um, Congress needs to, that's, that's what we're shooting for, right? The, the emergency declaration wouldn't be needed if congressional, if the congressional processes weren't, you know, the way they are, let's just say that. So um, same at the state level. I know tomorrow the uh, Senate Select Committee on Binational Cooperations meeting, it's chaired by our a representative here in the county, Senator Padilla. And there's going to be a lengthy discussion about that. And one of the questions they are raising is, do we need an emergency declaration, uh, both at the state and federal level? I continue to say we do. Uh, others may differ from that view, but um, I think it would get us uh, faster fixes because it sends a very clear message that we are in a state of emergency. We're not just talking about operation and maintenance and, and parts that are missing, right? So. That, that's my personal point of view. And and I would add something, another ad additional comment to what Paloma's mentioning is, is that if you're going to put in, you know, we want to request a disaster de declaration, I would also add, you know, advancement of the supplemental that includes the 310 million for the IBWC plant, very specific, very specific. And right now it's in the, um, in the, in the climate, not the climate, in the disaster relief uh, supplementals uh, for the nation, but there are three supplementals going on right now. There's a Nas there's a national security supplemental, there's a border security supplemental, and there's this particular one that I just mentioned, the disaster relief su supplemental. It's really important to say we don't care what supplemental it goes into. Three hundred and ten is the three hundred and ten million that right now is already in one of the supplementals, which is a huge accomplishment, a huge accomplishment that it got in. Thank um, you. <clears throat> thank you so much. We are just about to eight o'clock. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for being here. Thank you to Rosette for helping field these important questions. And uh, please, everybody, fill out our event survey. And there's a lot of great information in the chat. So um, uh, capture, capture that information, too. The video will be available online starting tomorrow. And uh, I just wish everybody a good night and a happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you good so night. much. Thank you very much.